Thank you so much, and uh, welcome. And thank you for allowing me to be here. Uh, incredible experience over the last uh, few days. Uh, I didn't, I forgot that I did all those things. <laughs> uh, I need to tell you a little bit about uh, my next adventure, too, that's coming up really soon. One, I've been invited to go down to Qatar to uh, be part of a, a Canadian global college. Uh, we signed an MOU with the College of the North Atlantic and we invited down to be part of that delegation for two days and maybe spend a little bit of time. Um, you know, uh, my bucket list is ride a camel. Get <laughs> 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 lost in the desert, maybe. Who knows? And uh, the next one I'm doing in April, I'm going back to Hitboro to uh, try and get the remains of some of our people to be brought back to Canada. I've made one trip already, and now I've got uh, signatures from a lot of people, and uh, I'm going back to have another round of discussion to see if uh, somewhere along the way uh, we can make this happen. Um, it's been done before. And there's no reason why, after all those years, that, uh... Oops. Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm not used to talking to those things. But, uh, anyway, in April, I'm going back to, uh, Edinburgh, and I was telling James that, uh, you've taken the remains of our people for study for over 200 years, so I'm going to dig up Bobby Burns and bring him back. <laughs> You can study our remains uh, of our people, we can study theirs. There's something we can learn. Anyway, I um, want to show you probably a little bit of uh, on our canoe crossing. Um, I got to say, uh, when I walked into um, the storage space, the warehouse where all those canoes were stored, to me it was like dying and waking up in canoe heaven. That's the only way I. I can describe it. I've been to Rome and I've been into this real fancy chapel where you look up and see all the beautiful paintings. I was impressed with that, but uh, not as impressed as walking me to that building and seeing all those canoes, the incredible history and stories that must go along with all those canoes. Even the one canoe in that looks terrible. <laughs> I'm sure the story with that one do it well. But our, our story with our canoe started so many years ago. I was in Calgary uh, supporting the Lucan people who were protesting outside of the Glenbow uh, Museum. And because I was there at the time to support uh, the Lucan people, I couldn't go in and look at the canoe that was made in Newfoundland for the governor of France. I later went back, uh, spent uh, a week with the intention of taking the canoe and bringing it back to Newfoundland. Kind of naive for a Newfoundlander to figure you could do that. I figured I had it right, but uh, it didn't happen that way. So I uh, sketched and drew pictures and took some pictures and um, ended up, uh, to be honest with you, losing my job as a chief because I spent money going to look at a damn canoe. <laughs> but the uh, dream didn't die, and uh, somewhere along the way I decided that we. Uh, would get uh, Rennie Martin from Listigus, Quebec, to come down to teach our people how to build our first part of canoes and the current of building canoes have been gone for our community for well over 200 years. So we built the canoe. The only problem was that uh, when it was built, we built that the show canoe, not very wide. It was, as you'll see in the picture, in the video. And uh, I'll have to tell you the story how we fixed it. So I'll let you watch some of that, that video of that canoe. Uh, <coughs> 20, 24 foot canoe with a 32 inch beam. Um, you sat in there, you was afraid to paddle and afraid you were going to tip it over. And Charlie Lavador, who was from Nova Scotia, came down and he said, uh, and we talked about storing the canoe for the winter rats, what were we going to do with it? And he said, our people used to sink to be in the bottom of the lake. And they would store it that way for the winter months. So it sounded like a good idea. 
So I took it out to a park near Conway River and took it off 10, 12 feet of water, filled it from the sandbags, and sunk it. Two weeks later, I had a call from the guys from Perfect. You better come and look at your canoe. It was up on shore. <laughs> I was taking that sea possible and somebody deliberately took it all to shore. But that canoe came on the bottom of the lake, halfway up on the beach, still had a sandbag in it, but it was now a 42 or 43 beam. <laughs> So we, uh, we put some sticks in it temporarily to, to keep it that way. Took it back in the conveyor and stored it in my shed. You saw my little shed that I started with. You know, we barely had room enough to do anything. Now that, that shed is 100 feet long, 40 feet wide. So more and more stuff gets built there. It becomes a community shed, not mine any longer. But uh, we didn't went on to try and cross the Gulf uh, the third time we left. We uh, had a much larger canoe. We, we put the spirit went back. She had done her duty, taught us how to work together as a team, and we built an incredible 30-foot uh, bridge park canoe. And I had custom litter seats made for it, you know, for a long journey across the Gulf. And off we go. So I don't know if Dave, we can go to that part or not. I don't know if you can kind of sit up. Did you want to say anything about the community in the middle? Well, we could, yeah. We could. Uh, probably need to understand a little more about our community and what the struggles have been. And uh, I saw it all about it. And uh, we probably, it's the newest. Uh, band that's been recognized in Canada in the last number of years, uh, only since 1987. Um, we started with uh, very little, uh, recognized by the old colonial government in 1870, I believe it was, and set up the first reserve for us. And when the Newfoundland government joined Confederation in 1949, we were deliberately written under the terms of the Union. And after uh, three years, you can get your hands on all kinds of information. So we found a, a discussion papers that took place about us and Newfoundland and Confederation. And uh, very little said about us except that no, there are no Indians in Newfoundland, we don't have an Indian problem. There was a big discussion about how to keep the butter yellow, the margarine. It couldn't turn the, the color of margarine. Uh, white and had to stay yellow. So that was a big discussion. But for us, no, 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 no problems in Newfoundland, no Indians, get on with it. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm not used to this. This is, uh, on, below here is, is a, we call a cross, and it's a magical place. Um, when people get sick, and not so much today as you we take people there, you gotta climb up a fairly high mountain or a hill, really rough, and up at the top of the hill across from this formation is a spring where people go and bring water back to the community for people that get sick. And there's all kinds of, of stories in the community of uh, people being cured from that water. And I was told uh, when I went there back in the early 70s for the first time that it's a spring near that formation that never dries up. So being curious, I figured I'd go in the middle of summer and see if in fact if the spring is uh, still there. The spring had dried up, but I was told it was a spring. So not far from there is a a waterfall. And I went looking for the spring. I went looking for a drink water actually, and I fell into the spring. I found the spring. And 
when you look at the documentation about the spring, I said it's got a fine sandy bottom and the water is cold. And it was so cold that when you put your hand in it, it was like putting your hand in the refrigerator. So I know it's on the spring. And those uh, seven virtues of life, uh, how we try and conduct our life at all times, extremely difficult, mind you, but uh, uh, the virtues of life uh, is what we try and aim for. And uh, the virtues of life, of course, is, is you're born in love uh, into a family and you're looked at in that way. Um, it continues on with respect and courage. Honesty. And the last one, I mean, the seven birds of life would be wisdom. And to in order to be an elder in any Aboriginal community, you have to be looked at as being wise in some way and not necessarily 100 years old. You could very well be a 25 year old and still be wise. Now, the fun part of that is that a lot of people try and aim for that pedestal, if you want to call it that. It's fairly easy to get there, but it's not so hard to stay there. Not, not so easy to stay there. Because all you've got to do is do one thing that's not right and you're kicked off of there. So that's why it's a uh, we have so few elders in our community, only me. <laughs> I'm, I'm not an elder, and we do have elders in our community. Well, humility is one of the things that we, we learn early in life, and to be truthful at all times. Um, even when you're telling your wife, you know, I'm, up in Ontario, and it's not really cold here. <laughs> um, by the way, I have to tell you about my wife a little bit. She says that uh, I was invited to speak at a nurses' convention some time ago. I'm doing this a big mommy, though, I'm telling you stories. And I got up early in the morning, and I was told to wear a suit, tie, and a, and a shirt. Now, the only sh clean shirt I could find that morning I had one of those. Uh, shirt that required cufflinks. And I only had one white shirt and I only had the holes for cufflinks. And so I found the garbage ties <laughs> on my shirt. It looked good to me. My wife got up like she always do before I go somewhere and said, let me look at you. And her words is Jesus, Mary and Joseph. <laughs> You can't go just like that. <laughs> I said, no, that's all I've got. So I spent the whole time in the speaking to the nurse like this. <laughs> my every study would show. <laughs> and this is where we're located in that Malibu Gig. Up somebody out of Malibu Gig, by the way, is the official name of our reserve. It's that way because uh, in 1987, Federal government asked for a uh, translation of, of our community, one of the nice big one name. And I spoke to another, and he said, that's all one one. He said, okay, Hapsaleo uh, Adish Malbuik is your name. So I give that to the federal people. It's on all of our documents. Anything that we sign up with that is Hapsaleo Adish Malbuik. And God loved them. They never asked for a translation. <laughs> Six months later or two months later, I like, came back and said, by the way, Chief, what does that mean? That's too damn small. <laughs> so, so the name of our reserve is too damn small. <laughs> so they agreed with us, so we now have much more land now. <laughs> And this is where we are, and of course it says welcome to Mahogogik, Hapsam Yajish. And as uh, Cedar read out in her opening remarks, this is, you'll find that on the office walls, and everybody's got one of those, and 
we try and live by that as much as we, as much as we possibly can. We, we aim for all of those things. Um, beginning of our, of our story, um, had some time to tie to, to the province in the earlier years. Um, we fought with the province tooth and nail because they continued to take our money and make us beg. Um, then when later on we went into a different kind of funding arrangement and then became recognized by the federal government in 87. This is um, telling Jeremy about the bundles that our people used to have. Um, those bundles, they're trying to probably weigh somewhere in the range of 100 to 150 pounds on their back. They walk all day. That's our earlier houses in Cod River. Um, they were warm, comfortable. Not a lot of room, but they're warm, comfortable. Big families. And when you live in a house like that, you want to keep warm so you have big families. <laughs> We didn't have a road until 1975, um, I believe. And never had a paved road until uh, much later. Um, when I lived on the river the first time in, oh, over 50 years ago, I ended up in Toronto, I was only 16 years old. There was no electricity, no phones, no road. We basically lived in the woods. And I remember getting on an old uh, coastal steamer that came up the coast. I was so amazed with uh, electric lights that were going around the ship, flicking lights. <laughs> then and now, big change. Uh, we've been looked at across the country uh, by uh, government and other First Nations as a model community because of our transparency and our governance, our accountability to our people. We uh, tell the federal government all the time that we are accountable to our people first, and then we're accountable to you. And we've been able to maintain that. This is basically our structure of our community. Uh, we took away. The big thing for us was uh, education in Newfoundland was controlled by by the by the churches up until 1985 when we went and met with the, the church who controlled our school. I had very few graduates, um, deplorable conditions, and we managed to get a meeting with the school board. And the chair of the school board was a priest. And keep in mind that our language, our culture was outlawed by church or priest in 1921. So we, we spoke none of our language and was never taught in school. And we sat in that meeting room that day and at the end of the one end of the table sat the priest and I was at the other end. I told him what I wanted. I wanted to have control of our education. And he said, Chief, he said, if you're fortunate enough or unfortunate enough to get your hands on education dollars, what are you going to do with it? Do I buy booze and cigarettes? Because you know absolutely nothing about education. The only response I would take off past now was, well, we can't do any worse than you've done far. <laughs> <laughs> A month later, we had, to, we had control of the school, the church, the land, and the take everything. We thought we were great negotiators. But the simple truth was that we didn't get it that bad because we were good negotiators. We got it that fast because he thought we couldn't do it, and in a short space of time we had to give it back. Well, guess what? <laughs> we now have uh, a lot of graduates. We've got this year our first young intern. We've got lawyers, nurses, every person that we need to build a community been gone through our school, gone out for higher education, and we need a plumber, electrician, we send them out to be trained and come back and work for us. And we need social workers, we send them out and sometimes we send them to other countries to work at our expense so that when they come back, they come back with a, with a 
really good education. We are running a fishing line just now. We needed the aircraft and we needed someone to fly it. We trained a pilot and we sent him to work with another company for two years and brought him back to work for us and now we fly their tiny bit of aircraft and that service our hunting and fishing camps. We now own 10 fishing boats. We're not part of a treaty in Newfoundland. The Chief Justice Barry claims that if we want to be part of a treaty, we have to move to Nova Scotia. We're immigrants to Newfoundland, he says. So we so oh, thank you very much. So we've used that to leverage money uh, because we're not part of the treaty, so we don't have any money. So we have we have nine apartments, uh, as you can see, uh, and they all answer to the community. Um, our our general manager, and that's our structure. Our general manager was 12 years old when we went and took over the government building in St. John's. We put a padlock on the inside and said, you're not coming in until you give us back what rightfully belongs to us. And our general manager now was a grandmother and uh, she was 12 years old at the time. And um, yeah, I was put in jail. <laughs> Terrible. We was told to go home and the good little Indians now don't bother us anymore. And we didn't go home. We, uh, we stayed and we staged a hunger fast for eight days. Republic, had a lot of support from a lot of people, and uh, after great days they gave us our money. We got tired of seeing our faces in the news. And this is our, our government building. Uh, of course, those are things that now come under our government building. We have a, when I was growing up, I remember. Uh, Part of the story, part of it was told me by my dad, my mom, and my grandfather. I got sick, I was four years old. It took them a better part of two days to get me to an hospital. And the last part of that, they had to walk up and down with me on their back and down the other side over to a cottage hospital. And that was only an hour away to drive. But by then, they had to go by boat. We have uh, nurse practitioners. Uh, two nurse practitioners, uh, nurses, uh, and the director of health is actually a nurse practitioner who come back and worked under a uh, different director and now is now the director of health. And uh, we have a round the clock, 24 hours a day, nursing care for all of our people. And uh, before actually the nurse practitioner was taken over from the doctor, they used to visit once a week. We uh, no longer have a drug and alcohol counselor. Um, yes, people still drink. Uh, there's just there drugs in the community. But uh, when I say we don't have a problem, it's there, but it's under control. Um, we do that by allowing a bird built in the community, actually. But we say we do that because we want to keep an eye on you. We don't want you going to officer, getting drunk, causing trouble, or getting killed, or killing someone else. At least if you're in the community, we're all looking after you, every one of us. And it works. The school is probably the most important part of our community in terms of building a nation. You can't build a nation if you don't have people uh, that being educated in your own community. We now teach our own language. Uh, we send all of our, our people out for technical training. Uh, we send them off to universities around the world if you want to go. Um, we, we have two lawyers that work for us that have been gone through our school system. And during, everyone that works in that, even our school, is all staffed not by our own people. I wish I know the priest's name and go talk to him. <laughs> Maybe it's a good thing, I don't But I just want to read to you something that inspired me about education. And it comes from Chief Dan George so many years ago. I think when he did advice to Centennial, they asked him to do, uh, his version, or he asked him to do something about Canada. But uh, Chief Dan George 
and did his own version of O Canada. And uh, the last part of that I really like because he talks about something that uh, really inspired me at the time and still inspiring me. So he talks about um, a new warriors. In our olden days, we had warriors that wanted to fight. We went out to kill. Today, uh, our warriors and our lawyers, our nurses, our teachers, and our technical people, we will no, no longer need to be out there having that kind of war with people. You don't need, no longer need to put a chain on the minister's door uh, to get your point across. And he, he goes on to say, before I follow the great chiefs who have gone before us, O Canada, I shall see some things come to pass. I shall see our young braves, our chiefs sitting in the house of law and government, ruling and being ruled by the knowledge and freedom of our great land. So shall we shed the barriers of our isolation. So shall the next hundred years be the greatest in the proud history of our tribes and our nation. But he, he talks about the new tools that the Europeans, the non aboriginal people brought to us that we have ignored. And that's education. We didn't realize that we had an incredible tool in our, in our arsenal until we looked at the education that has been taught out there. In order to get our people out into the world to do the things we need to do to not only build a community, but to help build a nation, we need to get them into the universities. We need to get them back to be working for us, helping us build a community. As you saw what our community looked like, uh, those little shacks, basically how we live. Some houses were better than that. But today, uh, everybody owns their own house. There's no free houses in Condor. Everybody buys their own house. When you buy your house, you buy things that you need, one thing that you're guaranteed is that you're going to look after. So the dependency on us to constantly be going, putting a doorknob on somebody's house or putting in a window, fixing things, is now left to the, compete, the people themselves to maintain what they had to buy themselves. So that's the difference in what we've been able to do. The government only give us enough money to a welfare budget is all we have to build three houses a year. We're building 20 houses a year, simply because their houses are not being built by people themselves. We have a 100% employment. And if you have a 100% employment, you don't need to have a free house. But everybody in the family is working. So you can afford, as long as we can set up programs to allow people to borrow that money to build their own houses, that's what's being done. Come a long way from uh, the first house uh, CMAC and uh, put in the condo with my house. And nobody wanted it, and that's why I took it. And, uh, and James said the change from a system that we had in 1988, but he simply changed because um, it took so long to get uh, the mortgage, it was the first one, true. There was a coup that took place, and I was accused of stealing $100,000 to build a house. On the day that I was taken removed from office, it was the day my mortgage was, was approved. <laughs> <laughs> so I had six years of uh, recreation. <laughs> and those are uh, the people that I work with. And those are the people that come back and educated from, uh, from an incredible journey, I think. Uh, the helicopter pilot has gone to our co-op system. We got him trained. We sent him on to fly for another company, and he's now back working for us. Shane McDonald is our band lawyer. Made him work with another firm for two years before he came back to work with us. Rod Jador, who is our director of education, sent him on to Nova Scotia to make my merge and work for another school board before he came back to work for us. Ada John, our first big mom, nurse practitioner in Newfoundland, sent her off to work for, for a, a, a hospital in which we All of those people did not come back to work for us until they had worked someplace else first. So when they came back, they had 
not only the education under your belt, but also they had the work experience and work with someone else. And they come back with an incredible, incredible story to tell. And those are uh, some of the partnerships that we've been able to develop over the last number of years. Um, we, have a, we have a really good working relationship with Perth Canada. Uh, we signed an MOU with Mi'kmaq to promote uh, tourism. We uh, have a really good working relationship with RCP. Uh, Newfound Resources is a company that fish or shrimp when we had some shrimp, we don't have any more. We just recently uh, partnered with a company in um, Fort McMurray, uh, Rough Rider International. And that one is basically a cleanup crew that go out and clean up spills and try and make sure that uh, the place is kept clean, the birds don't land in um, the tail of the pond. And so we get involved with them for that reason. And we're looking for more partnerships so that we can start moving away from depending on the federal government as welfare dollars to be able to have the dignity of look after ourselves. We have um, an education system that has one is an high school, university one. One is a technical school. We're now negotiating with uh, the College of the North Atlantic to put a satellite office in Con River so that we can start to train heavy equipment operators, pipe fitters, electricians, carpenters, all that would be done within Con River. We would save money by doing it that way so we could have more money to put into education. And the university part of it, well, uh, there is a waiting list to get into the university by students. That's something like 10, 12, sometimes 15 students graduating every year going out for our education. And one of these days, soon I hope, that one of those young students are going to come back and they're going to ask this old fellow to sit beside and they're going to take over the reins. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. After, after they have my remarks. <laughs> I'm not going to try and read that out to you, it's, uh, it's there. Anyway, I can tell you this story though. When I went to Edinburgh um, before Christmas to that talk, my first round of discussions with the museum about bringing remains back to, to uh, Newfoundland, my flight was two hours late getting out of uh, St. John's. I knew that I was going to you know, within my heart, I'm going to miss my flight, and I'm going to be stuck somewhere in Ireland somewhere, and I'm never going to get to Edinburgh. Um, so when I got to, uh, got off the flight, went into the airport in uh, Dublin, an enormous lineup of people waiting to go through. You know, don't feel, you know, don't tell God I told his lie. <laughs> I went over to Air Canada counter, counter and I said, excuse me, man, but I can't read English. <laughs> <laughs> I had my cap all down on my I can't read English. <laughs> I said, really? Uh, what language do you speak? I read. I said, big mom, man. She said, what's that? I said, well, that's the language of Newfoundland. That's how all I can speak. As you can't speak or reading, oh, I could speak in a English man, but I can't read. I don't know how to find my gate. So bypass all this big line of security. <laughs> took me right to the gate and said, you sit right there, watch that there. That's your flight. Don't move. They'll tell you when you go on. I got, I got my flight and I got there on time. <laughs> Forgive me, Lord, but I had to tell you that. <laughs> so, have you ever traveled? You feel like you, uh, you know, need to get ahead of life. <laughs> By all means. <laughs> Our future uh, looking bright uh, so far, coming from uh, when I left over 50 years ago. Uh, extremely bright. 
By the way, I happened to go back home because my mom had wrote me a letter and told me that we now have phones in the community. You can phone home now. And uh, 10 people on the party line. <laughs> I got out the number this night and I got the chief on the phone and got talking to him. And uh, said, we're just starting to a sawmill, we're just starting to buy some equipment. And they said, you should come home. And you should take some of the younger people out of the harbor and get the equipment. That's what I was doing. And a month later, I showed up in Con River, left a good paying job, and uh, going to work for three dollars an hour. I've been there ever since. <laughs> some of the successes we've had, of course, is uh, the teamwork. Our team, I believe, came about when we had a hundred people go to St. John's to take on the government. And they were young kids, like our general manager, 12 years old. My daughter was 12 years old. Three of us was inside with a chain across the door padlock. And uh, I was answering the phone, by the way, that day, and uh, telling everybody to give everybody a day off. But we did uh, get pulled out of the white police, taken off to lock up, and charged $50 for this shift and told them to go home and be good Indians. We did. <coughs> um, two months later, three months later, uh, the RCAP called me and said, we're coming down to bring all you guys up and hold this $50 client. I said, okay. And so I went around, I got the, I think it was 30 of us. I said, we got to be at the steps of the band office tomorrow morning to wait for RCP. And uh, they showed up with those vans and cars, lights flashing. We're all sitting there waiting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on the way across, he let me sit in the front seat right away. <laughs> that was nice of him. He said, why did you sit on the steps and wait for us? We figured you had to chase us through the woods. Well, you said you were going to pick us up, and we want to go to jail. <laughs> I said, why? I said, well, well, it costs you more to have 30 of us in jail for nine days than the $50 fine. Besides, there was a woman in the community that needed to go to the hospital with her, her child, and we gave her the $50. <laughs> so we spent our time for our mission. And that's pretty much, you know, uh, our story up today, anyway. Um, I can show you a little more of this canoe crossing. Um, by the way, while I was there talking to James, we sort of started hatching an idea of that we need to get a birch bark canoe from Newfoundland to Peterborough to the museum. And the problem we are having is. We don't have good bark anymore in Newfoundland. So if you know what we need good bark out there that we get our hands on, at least 24 feet long, we're going to build two canoes. And I know when I say this to you in public that I've got no signs of red to do it. That's our honor. We want to build two canoes. We want to paddle those canoes from Cape Breton to Peterborough. We yeah. want to leave one here and take one back. Oh, and the reason... <laughs> Damn it, now I've got to do it. <laughs> but when I thought of, of bringing a canoe to Peterborough, I take it that what a shame that we would have to ship it to, to you. It'll have very little history. It'll have probably our story and our work that we need to. But I want to bring you a canoe that's got some history. And what better way to have history than to have it from Cape Breton. We've already made a trip over from Newfoundland to Cape Breton, so we just got to get it from Cape Breton out here. <laughs> just, just got to do that a little bit. <laughs> we got the canoe back from Newfoundland, Spearman. We had a repair of course. And, uh, and we overlanded from Cape North down to Seal Mountain Bridge where we launched the canoe and 
continue our journey up into Bidore Lakes. Um, but I want to tell you some things that happened along the way. This one here, for instance, you can see that shot that's up, up into Bidore Lakes. A tanker went by. They're all sitting on the beach. Ha, ha, ha. 